Hi, this is John Delancey, and you are watching the Brony Clubhouse Network. Hello, everybody. My name is Spencer, and we are joined today by the wonderful John Delancey. Thank you for having us in your amazing home today. And we're going to be asking you some questions concerning the Brony documentary that was recently released. So how do you feel about the final cut of the film? I feel good about it, really good about it. <clears throat> you know, when you work on something as closely as we did, it's difficult to just have the same feel that you have when, you know, you who, let's say, have not seen the film and you see it for the first time. You, you know, you're just, it's just a big wash. For us, you look at every minute of the film has probably a good hundred or so decisions that went into it. So, um, but all told, I feel really good about it. Outside of the Brony fandom, how has the doc been received? Well, right now, it has not gone outside the Brony fandom, uh, which is what we are really intending for it to do. We need it to go outside the Brony fandom. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that um, it, it was really made for a larger audience. It, it was made to explain to people who might actually have ne very negative things to say about Bronies, or people who are just interested um, who Bronies are. Uh, uh, if it only stays in the fandom, it's sort of preaching to the choir. How does it feel to be part of this project, and has it changed your attitude about life in general? Well, I don't know if it's changed my attitude about life in general, but it certainly changed my attitude, which is essentially what we track in the film. You know, when I first found out about Bronies, I went through the exact same thing that most everybody goes through, because we've asked the question a thousand times. What do you think about a bunch of guys, 20 years old, who are watching a program, a, a cartoon intended for 10-year-old girls? And the response is almost identical all the way through. So having gone through that myself, we wanted to make sure that um, you were able to follow that in the film, which is how the film s sets itself up. And uh, the difference between me and, let's say, the newscaster, or me and the person who's not in trouble, Perverts, <laughs> is that I was willing to, to go further down the line. I, I was w willing to continue to explore. Oh, I want to find out. I want to find out more. I want to find out more. So that's the, that's the action of the film. That's, that's what this is about. Uh, and we've got to get the film, therefore, in the hands of people who would normally not make that effort. And they would be happy as you see in the, um, in, in, the, in the beginning of the film, uh, you know, happy to say, I've never seen it, but I don't want to see it. And, you know, this is the beginning of, you know, whatever, Armageddon or some absurdity like that. Now, a big question here is, I know that piracy has been a really big issue as of late. Would you like to address that issue and how has it affected the film and the crew? Well... I don't want to be wagging my finger, you know, about, you know, you shouldn't uh, steal stuff and what have you. It, the ultimate problem with the piracy issue is this, and that is, is that the film was never intended, nor will it have its best benefit being only rattled around the internet amongst bronies. It just won't. Um, it, it needs to be seen by a general public and essentially an unsuspecting general public. You know, somebody who goes on Netflix and goes, oh, what's bronies, what is that? And they, 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 they look into it. If they do that, I think that it becomes a show for them. It, 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 it's certainly going to be a little weird, and, you know, a lot of them are going to go, oh, my God, we're going to look at what that convention is. And, you know, they're going to have all sorts of experiences that they've, you know, that, they, that they've never had personally, but they're going to have vicariously through the film. But it's also going to ask some questions that are really important. And that is, you cannot judge a book by its cover. Um, tolerance is a rather big thing. Uh, isn't it interesting that, that, that there are, there's a group out there that conflict resolution and getting along and making things work is really more important than the polarized world in which we live in? These are the big ticket items that uh, that are the, the reasons that I got involved in this because that's what I saw in this. To get to that point, we have to go through a distributor. 
Well, if the distributor takes a look and goes, well, Jesus, it's everywhere. You know, you don't go up on YouTube, it's everywhere. The distributor is not there because he wants to make sure that tolerance is taken care of or that, you know, bronies are have, you know, have a good name or something. He couldn't care less about any of this stuff. He cares about what the numbers are because he has to put in um, um, uh, marketing and advertising and, you know, he has to, he has to ante up to be able to get, get the film out there so that he can make his very sizable cut from it. So, so we then, because of all of the pirating, we, we are, that, that opportunity is getting less and less and less for us because distributors are going to be looking at it uh, and not have quite the, uh, it's not going to have quite the allure. Um, there's also been this other issue which has been, um, it's, it's hard for people to understand. People who don't make film, especially in the, in, uh, uh, people who make films as hobbies where you can spend a lot of time and you know, you've got, invariably all the equipment that uh, the professionals use are now available at, at, as a pro consumer level, you know, at a consumer level one. I mean, they don't understand that $320,000 is not a fortune. It is actually sort of what documentaries come in for. Uh, and that most documentaries take about three years to, to go from the start to finish. And that Mike and I, when Mike proposed this notion, it was a $60,000 discussion, a, a, a um, kickstarter thing. Well, what was budgeted in there is how much time we were going to be involved. You know, well, you know, it's in June, we'll be finished by August, you know, okay, it'll be fun. Obviously, sixty thousand dollars is a much more modest bit of, 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 of filmmaking than than what we got. We got five times that amount, or whatever it was. So we put all that time into it, and we we ended up instead of having fifty hours of film, we had like three hundred and fifty hours of film. Well, when you've got that many that much hours, you've got to bring in more editors and, you know, more, everything's more, more, more. So we put all of the money into that. Um, and now, uh, from a, you know, business point of view, we're going, oh my God, this is, this is not looked out. Uh, yes, the film's out there, and for a community that generally thinks of as anything on the internet is fair game, that's great. But that's caused uh, that's causing us concern. And uh, and as I said, in the big picture, it's that it's going to really impact the ability for us to get this to a larger public because the a, 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 the a distributor is going to just go. I don't know. You guys seem to. Have whether you wanted to or not, this film's distributed already. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because I've, I've been scouring the internet and there's one or two people out there who are trying to get on YouTube and, you know, personally I've done my part to kind of... Well, and also, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, we've already paid, the community will say, well, we've already paid for this. And you go, well, actually you didn't. You did like, I don't know what the number is exactly, but let's say 3,500 people paid for it. Okay? And those 3,500 people got t-shirts and and, and and got the film mm -hmm. <laughs> they got the film so yes they did pay for it and they got the film uh, in, in as downloads or as or what will be uh, uh, blu-rays or DVDs but the rest didn't so that's that's the and we were kind of going with the model that um, that wasn't going to happen but that it has and uh, and I guess, you know, I don't want to make this too long of a thing, but to understand that there are ramifications. I, I you know, Nick already knows the ramifications, and that is, is that we're sitting on a lot of extra footage, but a, and which people are saying, oh, we want to see that. You kind of go, well, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you want to see it, but we also have to hire an editor, and we have to have it color corrected, and we have to have the sound done, and we have to blah, 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 blah. and it becomes not 
quite the the extent of work uh, uh, as the as what is out there now. But it's still a lot of work, and somebody has to do it. So that's definitely not. I mean, we're not. We, we thought we were going to jump into that right away, but now that's being held up. And trust me, personally, I'm very excited to see what comes out on the Blu-ray copy. Um, can't wait for that. Oh, but I'm talking about far more than that. Far more than the Blu-ray copy. <laughs> I mean, there are whole segments that we didn't use because, you know, one of the things is, is that also there have been questions about, well, well, why didn't you make it three hours long? Or, you know, so, well, for a general public, three hours is out of the question. As a matter of fact, what's very interesting, and you, one begins to learn it as a, as a professional, is that you can take somebody up to, let's say, 90 minutes. Let's say 90 minutes was the, the sweet spot, okay? You can take somebody up to 90 minutes, and it's fabulous. I loved it. Oh, my God. What wonderful. Oh, I could have watched it forever. You, but if you happen to go 95 minutes, maybe that extra five minutes, people are going, And now it unravels deep into the film. And they go, well, no, well, no, it was awfully long. No, it was interesting, wasn't it? So you have to be, you have to play that game very, very closely there. How long is, is how, how long is just long enough? It's still wanting, making people want to have a little bit more, but not going, because if you go over just, just five minutes, you can unravel a lot of good work. Now, what was your favorite part of the film? Oh, I don't know if I have a favorite moment of the film. I think that um, I certainly like Daniel's story very much, but then I like Alex's story, and I think you know, I think Lyle's story, and I I, I'm, I feel very sympathetic towards Lyle's father, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, so there are a lot of things I feel good about and close about, and understand is that the film is not there to be uh, a complete record. It's not there to answer all the questions. As, as a matter of fact, it's not even there to answer questions. It's mostly to pose the questions. And, um, and I believe that maybe there will be more documentaries and people can go off into other areas. But as a general uh, um, exploration of what is, as, as it says in the title, the very unexpected fan base of My Little Pony, I think it does a really tip-top job. Now, at the very beginning of the movie, there are some talking heads. Uh, what gave you the idea to do something like that, where you have the bronies talking, and how did you find all these amazingly attractive people to interview? Um, there was a lot of discussion about how to start the film. And I had... Uh, that was... Uh, that w one was an idea that I personally had. There are many, many ideas in this film that are not my ideas, but you happen to pick one that is my idea. And I said, I would like us to focus in on a brony and to hear their story and how best to do that. Well, the, the best way to do that is to just say, what, 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 I forget what the questions are now, but... but you know what how that was posed so that we get really we really understand what the issue is right off the bat uh you know we understand it's a it, we see and understand it's a 20 something year old guy they are saying yes unbelievably i am watching a show that was intended for a 10 year old girl and as crazy it may as it may seem I sort of really kind of like it, and it's really sort of interesting. And then we have the reaction to it, which is again very organic. Oh my God, they're all you know weird, and they're, you know blah 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 blah. And uh, and then we have the media, how it distorts that, and then we go into the into the piece. So it, all of that is laid out at the very beginning of the show, so we understand what the what the subject matter is and what the conflict. And I, you know, I like that you got some, you got some good-looking fellas for that one. <laughs> now, a very popular question that a lot of Brodies have been asking: Tell us about the Discord statue that was featured in the film. The Discord statue is mine, <laughs> <laughs> and no one's going to get it. 
I have been asked them too many times, well, you know, I'll buy it from you and stuff like that. It was a gift. It was a gift from some um, Russian bronies. Um, it was delivered to me actually here at the house by Mike. It had been sent to Mike, and uh, I immediately got online to try to contact these people. I, I don't know whether I ever did or not uh, because I didn't get a response. But what I understand is that it was a bunch of Russian bronies who got together. Whoever made the, the, uh, the, 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 the I, I don't even know what to call it, the figurine, the, the statue, what have you, is truly a brilliant uh, leather smith. I mean, it's just, it's all made out of leather and beautifully colored and what have you. And, and it's really terrific. And the only thing is, is that while the house is being un, in construction, I, I have it up on a shelf covered over because all I could see is the dog jumping up and, and eating it. <laughs> so it is, it has been put away for safekeeping. Yeah, it, it, I saw it and I just thought it was just... Amazing. <laughs> that has to be one of a kind. Yeah. I can't just go online and buy that thing. Right. Um, now, a very popular part of the film was the Let's Meet the Brony song that you sang. Uh, did you enjoy singing the Brony song? Oh, well, I don't call it singing. I'm not a singer. So all it was is me just doing patter. Uh, and, I, and, and it was not a particularly easy experience for me because I, I had never really done something like that. Um, uh, while I'm, I think I'm very good with text and, and stuff of that nature, um, uh, to actually do a song, a song that, you know, on a meter beat da, 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 is something that I, I, I never do. I like to say that people hire me not to sing. <laughs> so uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm flattered that people keep on call, calling it a song, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think of it as that. Of the three bronies mentioned in the song, what is your favorite type? Whether it's creative, the moderates, or the hipsters? Creative. I, I think it goes sort of without saying. I mean, I've made my life around making things of, of a creative nature, one way or the other. And uh, it's certainly one of the things that attracted me the most about the, about the, uh, the brony population, and that is, is that unlike, you know, the general sporting sport enthusiast population who kind of sit there and watch a game. Uh, what I liked a lot about it is that uh, the brony population actually makes things, so that, that was great. Mm -hmm.